G'day everyone, Kate here from the team at Narrate Church. We're in week four of our leadership series, We Need You to Lead. Adam talks to us about understanding scarcity versus abundance. He delves into scriptures which teach us the importance of taking care of others with a generous mindset and how this will ultimately benefit not only others, but yourself as well. As it reads in Luke, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Hi, you guys. I'm sure there's a limit to the number of times that that will be amusing, but I've not found it yet. <laughs> Love that little video. If you're a guest with us, that's kind of crazy, and hopefully we can make sense of that as our time unwinds here this morning, or what am I trying to say as we go through the morning? Uh, we are in this conversation about leadership, and you know, one of the things that occurred to me this morning as I was uh, just kind of thinking through the morning one last time was, I sure hope that this doesn't feel like me the guru and you the student, uh, because that's certainly not the posture that I'm thinking of this series from uh, in my conversations and relationships and just knowing what makes this place this place is I, I know that we're all leading in our own ways. Some of you companies, some of you offices, some of you classrooms, some of you a group of friends, some of you teams. And so I, I don't think of this in terms of me knowing anything you don't or even the staff knowing anything that you don't. I, I think of it more in terms of we are collectively constantly challenged with what our leadership challenges. And so uh, really, really the difference between me and the staff and you is what we get to spend our 50 hours a week doing versus what you do. I tell people I'm a professional reader. That's my job. I, I read and research professionally. So my hope here in this series is ultimately to create some language. Uh, I think a lot of these principles probably aren't new to you, but I don't know about you, but I find it very, very helpful when we're all using the same words and we kind of know what we're talking about. And, and I've already heard from some of you that the whole... Uh, bullets, not silver bullets. That that was very, very helpful and just in terms of voc- vocab sense. And then last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago when we talked about how do you fill in the blank, hopefully that remains helpful too of trust versus the s- suspicion. And this morning, I, I want to talk about these two words, scarcity versus abundancy. And again, I, I don't think I'm going to bring a new concept to the floor here this morning for, for the vast majority of us. Maybe some new terms. And these are terms that, that I were introduced, was introduced to for the first time seven or eight years ago. Uh, and, and though they, they touch on what will be some familiar themes to you, I just find the terms themselves extraordinarily helpful, especially to myself. When I, when I see myself making a decision, it's just helpful to, to call myself on, well, that would be a scarcity kind of decision. Or even amongst staff, we will often kind of talk in terms of that, that, that would be a culture of scarcity. That would be a culture of abundancy. And so that's what I'm hoping to do this morning. So this morning, before we jump into it, I, I'm indebted to my friend Brian Hopkins, who's the lead pastor at Journey in Bozeman. And it was especially during my times of going to grad school with him several years ago that he first introduced me to, to these particular terms uh, and also modeled them to me. He's one of the most gracious people I've ever known. Uh, also, uh, let's see here, there's a guy named Joseph Meyer who wrote a book called Organic Community, and the last chapter in that is very, very helpful to this end. And John Ortberg, uh, I find anything he does very, very beneficial, but particularly his work as it relates to abundancy and in the text, how all that comes together, I'm indebted to this morning. I'm going to use a lot of his scriptural observations this morning. And and ultimately, uh, the other thing that I was thinking this week as I was walking home from work one afternoon, trying to think, not stare at my device, because I'm working on that. Some of you will remember that little conversation. And it's not NFL offseason just yet, but a week from Tuesday, then it's going to get tough to not be staring at my phone as I walk home. Uh, as I was thinking to myself, I'm not just indebted to Hop and Joseph Meyer and these guys that I've never met in some cases, but, but really you all and this place. And uh, the longer you've been here, the more indebted I feel to you because what I realized, what hit me was we set off in those early days to create a movement that was going to be generous. And the way we say it back office in lots of places is generous almost to a fault. And what I realized is our ability to do that is only made possible by your willingness to embrace that. Our ability to do that is, uh, has, has everything to do with coming alongside like-minded people who are willing to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, let's, let's embrace this idea of abundancy even to our own detriment or just on the edge of our own detriment. So, so thanks. So really what I want to do this morning is compare and contrast scarcity versus abundancy and hopefully leave you challenged to step uh, further into a culture of abundancy. But first we have to talk about scarcity. Uh, to do that, I, I brought the earth with me uh, today, partially because, uh, and this is maybe a little uh, juvenile, but that's what I am as immature. Uh, I think that these things are polar opposites. 
that I think scarcity and abundancy, if we could cut you open and find that part of you that values, that part of you that believes, that, that core conviction piece of you, I, I think if we cut you open, what we'd find is one or the other, never both. Probably all of us have a default position, and it has a lot to do with our family of origin. I am, quite frankly, but for the grace of God, very much a no first person. I assume the worst, not the best. I say no, not yes. I think, and here's the analogy that I'm going to try to work this morning with you a little bit, is I think it's North and South Pole kind of stuff. I don't think you get to be both places at the same time, and yet I think the gravitational pull of the human condition is towards an attitude of scarcity. So with that being said, would anybody like my visual to take home with you? Anybody want a blue squishy? Yeah, too bad, because if I give it to you, then I don't have one. That, that's scarcity, right? <laughs> Thanks for letting me uh, ridicule you. Uh, so there's actually a story that's been stuck in my head and in my file for, for a couple of years now. Going back to the spring of 2013, uh, we were headed into our fourth year of being a church together and having been a part of a church before, understanding that in any organization there's new problems that arise with new opportunities and new growth. And so I called my friend Brian in Bozeman, who was a part of Harvest and Billings and then was a part of Bozeman and Journey. So he's seen several church plants start and kind of emerge over the years. And I said, Brian, I think I need to grab a meeting with you because I just want to make sure that we're asking the questions we should be asking as we head into our fourth year. And quite frankly, I need you to ask the questions that we don't even know to ask. <clears throat> and so Brian, <clears throat> excuse me, that's gross. Um, Brian and, and one of the guys on his staff, Derry Long, who has a PhD in cultural organizational leadership stuff, they came down to Helena, and I almost never do morning meetings because mornings for me are about Sunday, whether it's this Sunday or six months from now. I kind of reserve those for Sundays, which means I have no idea what coffee shops look like at 9 a.m. in the morning. Like, I spend a lot of time in coffee shops, but it's usually at 4 o'clock when I'm the last one there, and they're going, could you leave so we could close? Like, that's my deal. So they showed up at 9.30. We went looking for a coffee shop, first went to the fire tower, Jammed. I mean, some of you know this, but I mean, there literally was not a table to be had in the Fire Tower coffee shop. Went across the street to the Merc. That was fun. No seats, none, zero. So we walked out of there, walked back down towards the hub, but that was in the season. Some of you remember when hub was transitioning in its ownership, and so it was closed there for a month or two. And so we stood there on the curb, and it's like our, our offices looked like a surgical room at the time, like didn't want to meet there. It was just white and boring, and so can't do that. And we found ourselves kind of stumbling around, and we walked into this pretty obscure uh, coffee shop. I'd been in it one other time. It was kind of salads, kind of soups, kind of sandwiches, kind of coffee. It was located in a place where there are all kinds of office suites. And I'm sure this morning someone's going to come to me and say, I own that place, you're a jerk, and I'm sorry. That's just kind of the, the risk of the business. But we walked into the place, and we ordered our beverages, and we were walking back to our seat. And you know that, you know the stainless steel cart with the Rubbermaid tub on top? You know, you know what I'm talking about where you take your dishes and stuff like that. We walked by that, and above that, taped to the wall, was this handwritten sign, and it was written on kind of an 8.5 by 11 piece of computer paper in Sharpie or something, soiled, had probably been written six months ago. And both Brian and I stopped, and again, he's my mentor on this scarcity stuff. We stopped and we read it. And I don't remember the exact words, uh, but I can tell you it was all about forks. Like that was what the letter was about. It was about three sentences. It was some part angry, some part furious, some part shaming. And it said something like, to whoever's stealing our forks, knock it off. I mean, that, that was kind of the gist. And you quickly picked up on the vibe is, you know, guys would forget their fork and they'd sneak down and buy a cup of coffee and then take a fork and then they wouldn't bring it back. Or someone would come down and they'd buy a salad and they'd take it back to their computer and answer email over lunch and they'd take a fork and then, you know, they just, oh, there's a fork. And they'd throw it in the sink and wait for somebody who never showed up to bring it back down there. And so these guys were apparently, not apparently, they, they, they were, it seems, of the uh, impression that their business was failing because people were stealing their forks and they were mad. And they wanted everybody to know about it. And I'll never forget standing there with Brian. And it wasn't necessarily with this hypercritical, but just observing attitude. And he said, that's a culture of scarcity. And I went, oh, yeah, because I spent the last three or four years listening to him make this distinction. See, scarcity, it always assumes that less is worse. Scarcity from a personal standpoint is I've got to hold on to what I have. Scarcity from a business standpoint is the job is to acquire and keep, to get and to control. 
And I'll bet you, I just challenge you over these next couple of weeks, when you go to an establishment of any kind, whether it's the coffee shop or the doctor's office or whatever, I'll bet you what you'll begin to recognize as you familiarize yourself with this vocabulary is you have these, these antenna, is it antennae? How do you say antenna plural? Anyway, you have the ability to quickly discern when you're in a restaurant or anywhere else, is this a culture of scarcity or abundancy? You'll figure it out. I bet you. And yet the thing is, is it's not just a them, it's an us. Getting personal. This last fall, Kayla came up to me in the workroom one day and said, hey, uh, tomorrow, Sunday, could, could the leaders, could I borrow your Suburban to, to put the leaders in the Suburban and take them to Butte for the afternoon? Uh, suspect, right? I don't know that I want my Suburban in Butte. Just, just, <laughs> just kidding. It's just, it's, it's like when you live in Billings, it's North Dakota. When you live in Helena, it's Butte. Um, <laughs> And when you live in North Dakota, it's Montana, I'm sure. And when you live, anyway, but now here, here's the irony is uh, I had just a couple days prior, like put the Suburban in park, looked at the odometer when it works because it's hit and miss and went 150,000 miles. Ugh. We have, a, Teresa and I are very grateful. We have a 2001 uh, Suburban. It has 150,000 miles or did at the time. And I just kind of, and you know, you do that math of like 150, like what, what's 200,000 minus 150? Because I don't know that anybody gets more than 200. And you start kind of counting how many days are left. And then I got out of it. And because and, we've only owned it for a few years and I, and I was looking at the tires and we love it, just to be clear, because I'm German and I don't like to spend money on cars. So this is the nicest car we've ever owned. I was looking at the tires and we, when we bought it, we spent $900 on tires. I sold my high school 1965 Impala to buy tires, among other things, and a cargo box. And so I was staring at the tires going, they're about worn out. Like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to buy new tires before next winter. And then Kaylin comes up to me and goes, hey, could I borrow your Suburban? And in my head, I started doing the math. And I thought, uh, okay, 50,000 minus 200 times three because they're going to Butte. That, I mean, that, there's just this, this fewer miles. You know when someone asks and you're just instantly like, you get grippy? So I was walking home, <clears throat> and, and listen, I'm smart enough at this point. I know my first answer is no. I know it's not healthy, so I just go, time. I need time. Could I answer you tomorrow? And I, I'm, I'm grateful to do that. I've got to talk to my wife, make sure that the suburban is not needed, all those things. I'm walking home, and I'm, I'm making, like, Supreme Court-level arguments in my head for why he shouldn't get to use the suburban, right? <laughs> Sat down in front of my wife. It took me about 10 seconds into my argument before she looked at me, and she's like, you're an idiot. No. <laughs> And the other thing that I was reminded of was, was when I was the 22-year-old youth worker, there were two families who approached me at Harvest. I was never an advertisement. It was never anything. Two families who approached me and said, hey, Adam, if you ever need a Suburban, use ours. If you ever get, you know, you got to take students on a retreat, ever need another vehicle to take a whole bunch of kids one place because, uh, you know, we didn't have the vehicle for that, just, just use ours. And they weren't 15-year-old, 150,000-mile Suburban. One of them, it was a guy... Who, it, it was a, his daughter actually comes to church here. I wonder if she's here, but I won't point her out. Uh, it, it, it was a Denali Suburban. I mean, I, I mean, that felt like the president when I sat in that thing. He got a new one. And I mean, it, it, when it was like a one-year-old, and then I think he must have, his company got him one, because then another time there was another Denali. The other Suburban, and this is kind of funny, it was a 2001 Suburban, just like the one we drive only it wasn't 2015 when we were driving and it was 2002 and 2003 and 2004. In fact, one time we left that suburban parked on our curb overnight and someone hit it while it was parked. I promise that's the story. We woke up in the morning, the driver's quarter panel was crumpled and I just remember Rich going, yeah, just, you know, the deductible's 500 bucks. Just pay that. We're good. No problem. And here I am, Caleb going, can I use your suburban? And I'm going, no. Scarcity, isn't it? Like, gotta keep it because I'm going. I gotta buy a new suburban, and this was a really good suburban. And I don't know that I can find another one to replace it. You know where else this comes in is is with our money. And I know some of you are like, uh, okay, okay, I get it. I, I know. Let me, let me just say this: uh, this isn't a giving sermon. <laughs> That's so <laughs> corny. I'm really sorry. Um, but there's no wig. I'm not going to put one on. I promise. But th- th- this isn't a giving sermon. This is a leadership sermon. But it's about money too. This. Uh, there's 10 $1 bills. Scarcity is this simple. Nine is less than 10. Nine is worse. It's always worse. Eight, way less than 10. Eight is way worse. And where this goes, this is 10 $10 bills. I mean, that was 10 bucks. What do you do with 10 bucks? Eh, you might not even stop and pick it up on the road in this weather. But but $100? Like, like, you and your wife could have a date for the first time of $100? 
I mean, that, that's a night at Lucas, right? 90? Nah, I don't know. I might not be able to get wine. Right? I mean, there's way, and, and part of what this gets at is, is the nicer your stuff, the more of it you have, the, biggest your, the bigger your company, the more employees that you got to make payroll on, the harder it gets, isn't it? This, this is 10 $100 bills. I don't care how much money you make. That's, that's real money. 900 Eh, not so happy about that. See, it's, the, it's, it's a scarcity versus abundancy conversation. Is it simple math? That, that's really what this boils down to. Do, do, do we think in terms of less is always worse? And the great thing is, and man, I've just had a, a good time interacting with the Lord on that this week. The invitation of Jesus is to embrace a different style of math. Probably not one that's going to get you out of second grade, but, but a different style. Listen to what Jesus says in John. And listen, if you, if you try to put this in a flow chart or if you're type A and you love spreadsheets like I love spreadsheets, it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna work. But listen to what Jesus says in, in, in John 6. Give and it'll be given to you. Get, just get money out of your head. We don't even have to talk money. Give and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. See, one of the important observations that John Ortberg made that I just thought was brilliant was this is to simply say Jesus isn't making a command here. He's not telling you to do anything. He's making an observation. He's making a claim, a claim that can be tested. You can test it in your life. Many others have. We'll talk about even some professional tests that have been done. But he's making a claim that scarcity doesn't work, that it leads to bankrupt businesses and bankrupt homes and unhappy people. He's making a claim that there's a completely different approach, an approach we might call abundancy, and that it's superior. See, abundancy, it looks way different. Abundancy says, hey, you want one of these? I can't give you one uh, because I won't have one. Or excuse me, that's what scarcity says. But abundancy says something. Hey, would you like one of these? Anybody? Okay, so we'll, we'll get you some because we've got justice. Do you want to come throw some of these? No, don't throw them at me. <laughs> so la- last service, I just... <laughs> I know this is like really gross and it's like, okay, so when does like the golden trumpet come out? I know, but go ahead. Okay, ready? Okay, that's, that's good. I just need one. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to preach the rest of the sermon? I'm just kidding. <laughs> The best story I have, uh, everybody got their little earth? The world's gotten very small. Um, I was walking, or excuse me, I was thinking this week about a story that is a little bit messy, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Some of you remember there was a story that showed up in the Helena IR this last summer. It was on the cover page. It was talking about a, a new business that was coming to town, and it was coming to town, and it would be the third such business of its kind. It was the one that talked about a third brewery coming to town called called Ten Mile Creek Brewing. And of course, many of you will know that there's already two great breweries in town, Lewis and Clark and Blackfoot, both of them uh, very vital parts of the community in lots of very neat ways. And the whole article was about these new owners who were from Helena and their ideas and their desire to be downtown and all these different things. And that, I mean, I kind of skimmed through that. Excuse me. What caught my attention was the end of the article, which featured an interview with with a a guy who's become a friend of mine, a guy named Brian Smith. He's one of the owners of the Blackfoot. And in that last quarter or so of the interview, they asked Brian, hey, Brian, how do you feel about there being a new brewery in town? And he said, love it, can't wait. And they said, well, how how do you feel about them being downtown? They didn't have a space yet, but, you know, that's kind of right across the street from, from you. He said, think it would be great for downtown if there was another brewery. And that was kind of the tone of the last two or three paragraphs of the article I, I read it, and because I think that this mentality is so rare in leadership and we all need those inspiring stories, I immediately emailed him and was like, Brian, thank you. Thanks for reinforcing an attitude of abundancy. It was a few weeks later that we were having lunch because we planned some things together, and he's let me pick his brain on lots of things, leadership, and then I, said, I brought the article back up, and he just kind of stopped me. He said, Adam, let me just kind of explain where I'm coming from there. He said, I, I, I fully believe that as long as we're creating an excellent product, 
as long as we're treating our customers the way they ought to be treated, as long as I'm treating the employees the, the, the way they should be treated, we're fine. We don't have to look over our shoulder. There's plenty of business to go around. See, some of you will be familiar. What he's saying is abundance, he says, the size of the pie is not fixed. There's way more wins out there that go unclaimed anyway. We're not in competition with each other. We're just in competition with our own level of excellence. And though it's a little weird because it's about beer, it seems to capture this whole idea of abundancy and what Jesus is saying here, which is this, wait, wait, wait a minute. There's a completely different way to do math and it doesn't show up on a spreadsheet, but it works better. And I think as Christ followers or even people considering that mentality, it's important to remember this is at the core of the whole conversation. In Proverbs, which, man, I love Proverbs. And if you were to read Proverbs once a day for a month, you'd read the whole thing. And if you did it and wrote abundancy next to every proverb, you'd, you'd be blown away. Listen to Proverbs 11. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Did you follow that? Like, it doesn't make sense. If you, if you put that logic on your second grade math test, you're, you're going to fail. You're going to do second grade perpetually until you get past that type of formula. One person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. And yet if you've ever worked for somebody that had a scarcity mindset versus someone that had an abundance, you ever, ever been married to somebody? It's completely different. Uh, ever, ever ordered a coffee? at a place and quickly went, oh, this place is tight. There's, we keep going. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. My, my favorite one in Proverbs is, is chapter 28 on this whole topic because it's so blunt. It says this, the stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. See, see what, what Jesus, what, what the Bible, here's what happened to me as I was sitting at the kitchen table trying to justify not letting Caleb use the suburban. It was simply this, Adam, do you believe that you barely have enough and that therefore, because you barely have enough, you've got to keep it all for yourself? Do you believe that you kind of don't have enough? And there's other people somewhere, they do have enough, but that's not you, so he can use their suburban. Like, do you believe that you really don't have enough and therefore you can justify keeping it all for yourself because you don't have any extra? Do you believe that there's, there's a God? See, what Jesus, what the Proverbs are saying is there's this other formula, there's this other approach, and it's approach that says that there's this God who knows your needs and somehow multiplies your efforts, and I know it sounds freaky, and you're going, yep, this becomes name it, claim it, and it leads to personal jets, and I know it can go too far, but that doesn't make it wrong. It makes it wrong when it goes too far, but yeah, we can abuse it. You know, Paul in 2 Corinthians, I, I love what he says because he's talking to a church who had nothing, but had made an offering to a church who had nothing, like minus nothing. I mean, they had even less nothing. And he says this, remember this, <clears throat> whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you'll abound in every good work. See, there's this weird formula thing again. You know, I, I, I work really hard not to put people on pedestals, but I got their permission to tell this story. Some of you will know Zach and Tiffany Bushilla. Um, Zach's the guy that plays guitar over here a lot. Tiffany works with your kids and their eight kids. Zach's the guy with the eyes, right? right? Like the National Geographic. Like you, you go like, oh yeah, I know him. He's like, you go to the eye store and you're like, could I get the contacts Zach has? Because he's got the, eye. okay, this gets weird. But so, you've got nice eyes, Zach. So uh, he told me I could tell this story as long as I didn't make him stand up. So uh, some of you will know Zach, and ever since I've got to know Zach and Tiffany, they're passionate about outdoors. They're also passionate about climbing. Zach's a crazy avid climber, climber has coached community kids in climbing, lots and lots of climbing activity. And, I, and I'd heard from him several months ago that they actually had purchased a building to build a climbing gym in town, and there were some friends that had given some seed money to make this thing happen. And really his passion is for students and for, for families and to give people things to do that involve activity and so a couple weeks ago, it's probably been a few weeks ago, Kate had made a comment to me on Friday morning. She said, 
she said, hey, um, Zach, who was on the band the night before rehearsing, uh, invited her to go over to the gym that afternoon to see the gym. She'd want to go with me. So sure, yeah, I'll go with you. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm breathing so hard and my heart is racing. And, oh, it's all the throwing of the balls. So I'm going to practice Caleb's thing. <sighs> Ready? We're going to breathe. Okay. So <clears throat> I jumped in the car, went over, went over to, to, to the climbing gym. And, you know, it's often the case, like you hear about an idea and then you see it, and those are two different things. And we were looking at this building, and it's an old, I think, welding supply building, and they've been gutting the thing. And then he pulls out the drawings, and he was like, wow, I mean, I was picturing like a hold on a piece of plywood and a you know, lemonade stand or something, but this is like legit, super nice. And I'm looking around going, this is work. I was like, Wait, who's working on this? And the short answer was kind of me. I was like, when? Because he's an electrician, you know, works 410s or 412s or whatever, Monday through Thursday. When are you working on this? Oh, when I get off work till about 10 o'clock and then Friday and then Saturday and, and, and then Sunday. And I mean, they got three little girls, none of whom are even in school. So Part of me was just incredibly inspired because I know that vision is cheap and it takes someone willing to sleep on a cot and it became very apparent, like, these guys are sleeping on the cot and paying a heavy price for it. So you know how you think things subconsciously and then you don't realize that you thought them because that's what it means to think things subconsciously? So I left there. Again, Zach's on the band, Tiffany's with Nary Kids. Without realizing that I was thinking it, I was thinking, there, there's, there's no way Zach's on the next schedule. There's no way Tiffany's on the next schedule. Like, there's no way. Because I knew that the teams were working on their next three-month calendar because all of our Sunday teams, they work three months at a time. And so this was the middle of February. So they were working on March, April, and May. And, and I just assumed in my head, like, that was the end of Zach's tenure on the band. Because being on the band is a huge time commitment. It's four hours on Thursday for rehearsal. It's seven hours on Sunday morning. It's a big deal. And I'm OCD. And I know that when I'm OCD on a project, like all I want to is like you run to work and then you run home to the project, right? And you don't even see your family and you high five people as you wait because you just want to work on the project. So I just assumed like there's no, there's no way Zach will be on the schedule. No way Tiffany will be on the schedule. So I finish up uh, that whole subconscious thing. And it was a couple of days later where Kate had shared with me the band schedule and, and there's Zach. And I thought, well, that doesn't even make any sense. And that was the first time I verbalized it. And Kate reminded me that whenever she says that to him, he just goes, I, I, I can't not. Like I get, it's the same adage. I, I get way more out of it. Like it's, I, I just can't do it. And it was this reminder to me that every person who serves with us, that they, they don't do it because they've got extra time. Like raise your hand if you've got extra time. No, they do it because there's a different type of math. It's it's him and Tiffany, it's them going, we're just better when we reserve less for ourselves. See, this this is the invitation that Paul is making. Listen to the way 2 Corinthians finishes. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Do you see how different this approach is? Like sometimes I think we think that deciding to follow God or not follow God is this black and white, like how old's the earth or some silly thing like that. No, it's, it's how do you view life? What pole do you live on? Do, 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 do we believe that there's more to the math than less is less and more is more. You know, do, 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 you know my, the, many of you who, who I know who are in phenomenal, generous leaders, you're a step ahead of me. You know how you're thinking about the forks? I'll just tell everyone else how else you're thinking about the forks. You're thinking, dude, those forks are an opportunity. Maybe you should go to the store, buy some disposable forks, get rid of those metal ones that bite into your fingers anyway. Maybe you should put the word out, free forks at our coffee shop. Like, bring your salad, come get a fork. Maybe you forgot your fork, come steal a fork. We don't care. We've got forks coming out our eyeballs. (laughs) It's a posture of generosity that says, wait a minute, we'll get way more for that money we'll lose from giving away forks. See, Abundancy says 10 minus 1 doesn't equal 9. And I know that's creepy and can be weird. It says 9 plus purpose plus God on your team plus lots of other things is way more than 10. That, that's what the Bushillas are filling. That's what you guys fill. That's why you, you work 60 hours a week and you still figure out a way to be involved as a big brother and big sister or here or somewhere else. 
I don't think I have anything new to say this morning, you guys. I think that what you see in the New Testament is this constant refrain of Paul saying to the early Christ followers, you guys, don't be discouraged because I know you're exhausted and I know it seems like nobody's noticing what you're doing anyway, but it's the approach that God begs you to take. You know, you can test this. Uh, there's, some, there's some guys at the University of Notre Dame, a guy and a gal who, they wrote a book called The Paradox of Generosity. It's a fascinating read. And what they wanted to do was study whether empirically this stuff stands up to reason. So not spiritually, not religiously. They just wanted to know, like, does life work this way? Here's the summary of his research. You can read the book. He says this, giving is paradoxical. Those who give receive back in turn. By spending ourselves for others' well-being, we enhance our own standards. By letting go of some of what we own, we better secure our own lives. By giving ourselves away, we move towards flourishing. This is not philosophical or religious teaching. It is sociological fact. Again, this isn't a given sermon. There is no budget shortfall. This is a leadership posture sermon. You can also put it in the negative. Here's the way Christian says it in the negative. Uh, By grasping on to what we currently have, we lose out on better goods that we might have gained. In holding on to what we possess, we diminish its long-term value for us. By always protecting ourselves against future uncertainties and misfortunes, we are affected in ways that make us more anxious about uncertainties and vulnerabilities to future misfortunes. I love this sentence. In short, by failing to care for others, We do not properly take care of ourselves. As a businesswoman, as a businessman, as a parent, that's the crux, isn't it? That's the decision. You know, they've studied, as he says, all kinds of dimensions from purpose to avoiding depression to physical health to emotional health. What they found is in every dimension, a person who is giving towards others financially and with their time is enhanced in every way, and a person who is stingy is diminished in every way. One of the things they study is the process of giving blood. Did you know that when your body, when you give blood, the blood that remains, actually its ability to carry oxygen is enhanced? It's like even your body is made to give things away. The question becomes, is that the way we're finding the energy to live? Jesus, uh, another, here's another one, is this whole idea of giving and tithing. And I know some of you have started giving for the first time this year, and, and I hope you're, you're seeing how that works. M- many of you have been giving for a long time. Some of you, there's lots of things you love about Narrate, but the bucket thing, you're like, I, I don't get it. It seems cultic. Adam should go get a job. Okay. But the bottom line of what the scriptures teach here is is what they're saying is that that 90% plus God's blessing is more than 100% without it. And and, and if we put the microphone on the stage and and gave opportunity for people to tell that story, you'd get bored because there's not enough time to let everybody tell that story. The Bible says the smartest man who ever lived Jesus said this one day, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he poured out his blood and believed he was winning. And his body was placed in the ground. And then some mysterious power was unleashed. And three days later, Jesus walked out of the tomb, declaring historically, as we'll explore on Easter and forever, it is true that he was Messiah, leader, savior, and Lord, and declaring forever there is a way of living that is superior to scarcity. Listen, I don't know who it is you're serving. I don't know what it is your sector. I don't know whether you're in college or you're a businessman, whether you're a doctor or an attorney or a salesperson. But I do know that sometimes it just seems dumb that you're caring more for others and their their well-being more than they are for themselves. And yes, boundaries factors into this conversation. I guess I just want to remind you, 
And my invitation is to take this thing home with you. Maybe put it on your desk. And for the few days that you do notice it before it just gets caught up in the clutter of life, to use it as a reminder. What, what pole are you living on? And are you allowing the gravitational pull towards scarcity to win the day in your mentality towards others and stuff? You know, if you're new uh, to following Jesus, or even if you're someone that following Jesus is still a bit confusing to you, we often make it about these abstract formulas and these black and white political ascensions. But if we were to look in the scriptures, what we would see is Jesus inviting us to embrace this crazy reality that he is God, that he knows the number of hairs on our head, that he can provide for us in ways that don't show up in our budget, that he is faithful. You know, the conversation hasn't changed from the very beginning of the text. Are we or are we not finite beings gravely dependent upon the grace of God to get us through life? That, that's the question. I'd like to pray for you. God, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't want to assume the worst, but man, life can just beat the generosity out of us, Lord. Cynicism's cheap, it's rampant, readily available. Successful stories of good intentions are oftentimes so extraordinarily rare. Early commitment often fades and we find ourselves standing there holding the whole thing by ourselves. God, I pray for every person in this room who calls themselves yours that you'd give them you'd give them the tenacity needed to be the kind of businesswoman, the kind of businessman, the kind of leader, the kind of professional, the kind of parent, the kind of spouse, the kind of athlete, the kind of student, the kind of community member that leans in the direction of abundancy, that is willing to, to look silly having allowed your generosity to flow through them. God, would you give us wisdom on boundaries and we understand that this can become a license for all kinds of irresponsibility, but God, would, would you just, would you help us default in the direction of your grace? And God, especially for those that are just feeling beat up and empty, would you enliven their faith and their energy by the simple notion that maybe years ago they made the decision to believe that the world is yours. That every person on it is personally and intimately made by you. That when we step into relationship with you, God, we partner with the king of the world who walks one step ahead of us every time. Jesus. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.